Now that was just extraordinary. I'm so touched and I'm so moved and uh, I'm so delighted. Uh, I want to say a special thank you to Jill and also to Marty Anderson for nominating me. It's just a great privilege to share the stage with this inaugural class of Dawn List honorees and also, of course, with former First Lady Christy Bosak. It's so lovely to have you back in the state. And thank you. I also want to thank my family, all of them here and not here, my wonderful husband of 46 years, um, and my daughter Debbie Conlona Anderson and her partner Connie Newland. Um, these people and their uh, siblings and my grandbabies, I have substitute grandbabies here tonight. Debbie was kind enough, and you couldn't bring my real grandbabies to bring me substitute grandbabies. That's how thoughtful she is. Um, they have shown endless patience with me and they have given me unqualified support for whatever surprising thing I may decide to do. Um, I want to congratulate Dawn's List for how far we all have come. 1992, I think someone already mentioned, 1992 was supposed to be the year of women in politics and you know, it just did not work out. And so our friend, your friend and mine, Drew McGammick, brought a group of women together in Boone County and put their heads together and decided that we needed an organization to get democratic, progressive, pro-choice women elected to public office. I, I'd like to know who here was there in 1992 at that meeting. Raise your hands or stand up. Yes? Yes? Look at, these are women that we all owe an enormous credit for. And we have to continue the work that they started. But at the same time, we need to pass the torch to the young women in this room and across the state of Iowa. Dawn and the women's movement have empowered women in our state, but we are still underrepresented in public office. And we still make 77 cents for every dollar that a man makes in the same occupation. When Clara and I and other women in this room started in the women's movement back in the early 70s or late 60s, I made my first speech on women's rights in 1968 to a church group. I, I am very fortunate I did not get stoned. <laughs> and when we started out, Women made 54 cents for every dollar that a man made in the same occupation, so there has been progress. I started in politics when I was 16. John Kennedy, I, I, I was 16, um, John Kennedy uh, was running for president, and I thought he should be the president. And so I volunteered, and I, I, I went out to Merle Hay Mall, and I put bumper stickers on cars. Uh, sometimes whether they wanted them or not. Uh, and because I'm the oldest of six children, I was a natural to head the babysitting pool in Polk County. You, you, some of you may remember this. This is before we took our babies wherever we went. Um, we, we would send out someone to care for your children while you went to vote, assuming you were going to vote right. And, uh, and I was in charge of that. And when John Kennedy won, I thought I'd done it. I thought my babysitting pool had elected a, a president of the United States of America, and I loved that feeling. I loved that feeling. I never lost the joy that I felt that night uh, when John Kennedy was elected to president of the United States. I knew it was going to always be a part of my life, and it has always been a part of my life. In, uh, in 1972, uh, together with many women in this room, we started the Iowa Women's Political Caucus, whose goal it was to elect the women to public office. Uh, in that first election cycle, we supported 13 people, men and women, mostly women, who were seeking public office. One of them was Ruth Harkin, who was running for county attorney in uh, Story County. And of the 13 people that we supported, 12 of them won. And that gave us 
on the first group was one of them. And that gave the Iowa Women's Political Caucus enormous credibility as we started to work toward electing more women, toward changing the laws, and toward making a difference in the lives of women in Iowa and across the country. In 1982, as has been mentioned, I ran for governor. And I uh, loved every minute of that, <coughs> except for the very end. <laughs> I, uh, but I, people asked me at the time if I would, know, if I knew what would happen if I would do it again. And I said then and I say now, of course I would. Of course I would. I had the highest highs and the lowest lows I have ever had in my life. But I also brought people into the process who never otherwise would have been a part of the process. And I got lots of letters. After, after the election was over, including letters from very young women. And one that has stuck with me for the last 28 years is a letter from a third grader, a third grader. She wrote me a letter, printed a letter, and in, in it she said, our teachers tell us that girls can be anything. Thank you for giving us the example. Yeah, you really don't need anything else. So, I never thought I would seek public office again. It never occurred to me that uh, this glass ceiling would be one that I would undertake. Uh, but really, 100% anti-choice voting record, voting against equal pay for women, not once, but twice, and all of the other things that have happened, plus his adamant and hypocritical uh, opposition to health care for all, I think calls on all of us to do something. I look around in this room and here is what I know for sure. With your help, united, together, we can shatter this last glass ceiling. I ask for your help and for your support, and I want to leave you with my favorite quote. I've been inspired by the quotes of others. I, I have a favorite quote. It's one I've used many, many times. Oh, I have another one. <laughs> I do. Um, let me start with one that, um, I'm, I'm trying not to do this. I look at my, my wonderful staff that's helping me with this effort to become the first woman in the United States Senate. Senator, and they just um, do everything they can, everything they can, to prevent me from ad living. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a wonderful quote from uh, one of the Grimke sisters. There, you know, we're we're not the first wave of feminism; we're the second. And the the first wave of feminism resulted in the right of women to vote. And Angela and Sarah Grimke were Southern Bells, North Carolina Southern Bells. And they were very outspoken in their effort to achieve equality for women. And Angela Grimke is quoted as saying, I ask no favor for my sex, only that my brethren remove their feet from off our necks so that we can stand upright on the ground that God designed for us to occupy. from Elizabeth Cady Stanton, also a luminary of the first wave of feminism. And here is what she said, and here is what I have lived by, and would live by were I fortunate enough to go to the United States Senate. To men their rights, and nothing more. To women their rights, and nothing less. Thank you.